So thank you, thank you all for coming to learn about biofortification. And uh, it's unusual when two people meet in kindergarten that you end up working together <laughs> in, uh, in the same institute, but uh, that was the case for Rajul and I. And I, I hope you all enjoyed, um, let me get this started. I hope you enjoyed the uh, high iron bean video uh, from Rwanda. That was um, sometimes when I when I don't have enough energy when I get to the office in the morning. I play the high iron bean video and it it gets my energy levels going. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the panel. I'll I'll speak for about ten minutes and then we'll have three panelists each speak for about eight minutes. So let me. Let me introduce the panelists before I get started. So our first panelist is Namakolo Kovic, who's research coordinator for A for NH, and she's based in Addis. Um, she, her responsibilities include coordinating the Transform Nutrition Consortium research efforts in East Africa, working with the African Union on Nutrition, and supporting the Africa Afri the IFPRI Africa team on policy related nutrition research. Namakulo has expertise both in agriculture and nutrition. Our second panelist is Anna Marie Ball. She's a re senior research fellow in IFPRI's office in Kampala. She's the former Uganda country manager for Harvest Plus and disseminating the orange sweet potato and now manages Harvest Plus Regional Africa Partnerships. Uh, Anna Marie has expertise in behavior change, demand creation, and community health. And our third panelist is Mabu Posein, who's the former executive director of BRAC and currently the advisor to the executive director. Uh, he's a member of the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition. He's also a distinguished professor at BRAC University. Uh, Dr. Hossein has made substantial contributions to research and agricultural policy, especially in Asia. So let me, um, let me give you an overview now on biofortification. Yeah, I want to I want to show this picture of a, of a you know vegetables and fruits as a way of saying that diverse diets is where we want to be. We're going to be talking about mineral and vitamin deficiencies, and the ultimate solution to mineral and vitamin deficiencies is for everyone to be able to eat a diverse diet. We're going to be talking about biofortification which is something that can help along the way to reaching diverse diets. But because people's incomes are low, and because, as Rojol mentioned, because the prices of, vita of fruits and vegetables and animal products have been increasing over the last 30 or 40 years, let me repeat, have been increasing steadily over the last 30 or 40 years, it's been more and more difficult for the poor to afford a diverse diet. So because, because people cannot afford a diverse diet, they suffer from mineral and vitamin deficiencies. Today we're going to be talking about vitamin A, iron, and zinc. Vitamin A, it's well known that uh, administration of vitamin A capsules were shown to reduce mortality in preschool children on average by 23%. Because children suffer from iron deficiency in infancy, their cognitive abilities are compromised for life. It cannot be reversed. I heard on zinc deficiency, I heard a statistic at the recent uh, fortification conference in Arusha that 450,000 deaths a year can be attributed to zinc deficiency. So there are very serious public health problems. And biofortification that we're going to be talking about today is one way to help to reduce those mineral and vitamin deficiencies. Now, when these, the public health uh, consequences of these 
uh, deficiencies were first uh, discovered, really, 30 years ago. The nutrition community responded by, through supplementation, through commercial fortification. And really, agriculture wasn't seen as part of the solution back then. But we've really, we've really made a lot of progress in convincing agricultural science, scientists, agricultural policymakers, that agriculture has to be part of the solution. We, supplementation and fortification are also part of the solution, but we need all of these pieces of the puzzle to solve the problem. We all need to work together, and biofortification is just one piece of the puzzle. So what is biofortification? It's very simply taking a high-yielding variety and crossing it using conventional plant breeding with a high-nutrient variety. And after a process of, of breeding, which normally takes about six to eight years, you develop a high-yielding, high-nutrient variety. So for example, Africans eat white maize. They prefer white maize. But through the breeding process, we've been able to generate the orange maize that you see on the screen. Africans, in general, do not like the yellow maize, which is considered uh, animal feed. But you can see there's a big difference in color here. Maize is the most important staple food eaten in Africa. Vitamin A deficiency is a huge problem in Africa. If we can get Africans to switch one for one, to quit, grow, quit growing and eating the white maize and start growing and eating the orange maize, we can do a lot to help reduce vitamin A deficiency. The orange mazes are just as productive, just as high yielding, will sell for the same price. In essence, this is, this is what the biofortification strategy is all about. The reason that I was attracted to the biofortification strategy was its cost effectiveness. I, I've been at IFRI for ever since kindergarten. <laughs> and uh, it's ag agricultural research is very cost effective. And when applied to biofortification, it's very cost effective. You, you do the research at a central location. You get, the, you get the nutrients in the seed. You make those seeds av available for, to country after country. They're adapted to the country. They get in the food system. They, they can be grown year after year after year. The seeds replicate themselves, and you don't have recurrent costs. Say with supplements, cost a dollar per supplement. Uh, 500 million supplements are given out each year. You spend $500 million in a year, each year. Year after year after year after a decade, that's $5 billion. But with agriculture research, you don't have these recurrent costs. So, the, um, so our message today is basically that biofortification works. So we've been able to show that they can be bred into high yielding backgrounds and released. So currently biofortification, biofortified crops are released in 33 countries, 22 in Africa, seven in Latin America, and four in Asia. And they're in multi-location testing in 45 countries around the world. They're only released because they meet agronomic standards. They are high yielding. They are high profit. This shows the different countries around the world where biofortified crops have been released and are currently in testing. So you can see that it is a global reach now. We had to do efficacy trials. We've done Harvest Plus's commission 14 efficacy trials, and Namakulo will tell you about the results of the nutrition research. And we're starting to disseminate varieties. This is a map of different places in Rwanda where we've released 10 high iron beans that are higher yielding than the beans that Rwandan farmers normally grow. Anna Marie will tell you about some of our experiences in disseminating biofortified crops. So now we're, we're looking to mainstream use of biofortified crops in a number of institutions around the world. This is how we're going to be able to scale up use of biofortified crops, hopefully to a billion people by the year 2030. 
So the World Bank and EFAD are now riding uh, scaling up of biofortified crops into their grants and loans uh, to countries in Africa and we hope soon in Asia as well. Uh, the World Food Program, the Purchase for Progress program is now buying biofortified crops locally and storing them in their warehouses for their emergency programs. Regional frameworks, we, the Africa Union has endorsed the, the uh, promotion and the use of biofortified crops at the highest levels. Uh, the governments of Brazil, China, and India currently are investing in their own biofortification programs, and they have influence regionally as well. Uh, we're working with international NGOs. Uh, we work closely with World Vision. World Vision is starting to distribute biofortified crops in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Kenya, in Tanzania, just as a beginning. And Harvest Plus is providing technical advice. It's also important that we're working with the private sector. We have hybrid seed companies who are starting to develop their own hybrid varieties and as part of their business to sell biofortified seeds. So we know that with the, the goal number two is zero hunger under the, the new SDGs, which have goals to 20 to, to until 2030. So Harvest Plus's contribution to that goal is to attain uh, a goal of a, one billion people regularly consuming biofortified crops by the year 2030. That sounds ambitious, but because we can, it's a seed, and seed, seeds replicate themselves, all we have to do is substitute our biofortified seeds for the seeds that farmers currently grow. And we feel that that goal is achievable. So I think my time is up already. I've gone over. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll invite Namakulo to come up. <laughs>